International Conference, which was the first major conference to address the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. That conference was held in the Queen Elizabeth Conference Center in London, and Kosovo received kind of an invitation, but it was rather unusually phrased. It was a letter to President Rugova from Lord Carrington, then the chair of the Yugoslav Conference, in which he said, Dear Mr. Rugova, as you may have heard, we are having an international conference to settle the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. If you happen to be in London on day X, we would arrange for you to be admitted through the back door of the conference center and you would be permitted to occupy a salle d'écoute. A salle d'écoute is not the conference chamber, <laughs> but a separate little room where there was a video screen from which the Kosovo delegation was allowed to observe the conference. Once a day or so, Lord Carrington would come to that room, and as you might guess, he is a, was a very aristocratic figure and sort of would look at the Kosovars and quickly go out again, uh, not quite knowing uh, what role Kosovo should play. This treatment of Kosovo and of President Rugova and his delegation confirmed that the organized international community had some sort of feeling that Kosovo would be relevant, but was unwilling to disregard Serbia's insistence that Kosovo could not be represented officially anywhere. Hence the strange letter, if you happen to be in London on the day, not really an invitation, but some sort of acknowledgement that Kosovo in some way is likely to be relevant. At that time, all the Western analysts were talking about Kosovo as the powder keg of the Balkans. And as you know, Sir Noam Malcolm famously said, the conflict in Yugoslavia begins with Kosovo and ends with Kosovo. Well, are we coming 30 years later from this invitation towards an end of the Yugoslav issue? Because we are now entering the phase of what has been described a process of negotiation on a final, comprehensive, and legally binding agreement concerning Kosovo between the Republic of Serbia and Kosovo. Final agreement. Well, I have attended the final status negotiations on Kosovo, which was meant to be where and what? Vienna. I also attended the previous negotiations, which were in Rambouillet, um, where we were all locked up with some of my friends who still are active politicians in Kosovo at this point, to the extent of being presidents and others. Um, we were locked up in a French chateau for three weeks and were meant to emerge with a settlement of the Kosovo issue which had benefits in term of, terms of certainly my waistline, which was vastly expanding over the time, but which succeeded in terms of Kosovo constructively work, working towards a settlement, an interim settlement, whereas the Serb delegation was asking for a piano so that they could entertain themselves better in the chateau. Only at the very end did the work intensify and become serious. Then we had international administration, the Atasari negotiations, which were formally termed negotiations on final status. And those negotiations uh, were premised on the assumption that either Serbia agrees a settlement with Kosovo, or if it doesn't agree, the UN Security Council, in the exercise of its powers under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, will impose a settlement. But of course, over time it became clear that Russia would not allow such imposition and that the Republic of Serbia would not sign. This left Kosovo with the opportunity, nevertheless, to obtain statehood in almost a permissive environment. After Rambouillet, there was war. 
armed conflict over what Kosovo would be, involving the displacement, forcible displacement of nearly half of its population. The organized international community was then still talking about return to autonomy under Serbia. Vienna was different. Vienna was the acceptance that Kosovo will be a state, which is extremely difficult in the international system. Because the international system is made by statesmen and stateswomen who represent the existing states. And are they likely to agree a formula that makes it easy for parts of the state to become independent? Obviously not. So the international rules on how entities can become legally privileged in order to obtain statehood are very restrictive. Privileged statehood really mainly applies to former colonies in the sense of a right to oppose secession. The Yugoslav president overall confirmed that federal type republics where the federation disappeared might also turn into states. But the conventional wisdom had been that Kosovo had not been a full federal republic but had a dual status as a federal subject of the Yugoslav Federation, while at the same time being an autonomous province of Serbia. So it fell under that threshold, and considerable effort was expended in trying to ensure that Kosovo would not be treated as a state, would somehow return to autonomy. While I visited here, even during this visit, I've heard many former colleagues who negotiated with us in Vienna say Vienna was such a disappointment. We didn't achieve acknowledgement by Serbia of the statehood of Kosovo. My view is the opposite. Vienna opened the passport formally to statehood for Kosovo, to statehood that now nobody can doubt anymore. There's absolutely no argument that Kosovo is a state. Even those who haven't recognized it cannot deny its legal statehood. 115 or so states minus Palau yesterday, uh, have recognized, yes, Kosovo hasn't yet achieved UN membership or membership in a whole host of other institutions, but it functions as a fully independent state. So the gravest, most serious, most difficult part of the campaign was really achieved through the suffering of the people of Kosovo, 